and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight, coming to us straight from the for the formerly known as th as Three E Games. And the and the creators of the upcoming Ageless Chronicles ARPG in an Infinite World, that's a lot of that's a lot of worlds to deal with. The one <laughs> and only Christian Augustine. No, he's not from Hippo. Can nope. of Coke to whoever gets that joke. joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. Thanks. For, thank you for com thank you for coming on. Um. So. A bit of a tradition I have is to open with the humble beginnings in a sense. So, taking that into account, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what was it that made it stick for you? Um, so I've always been fascinated by role-playing games. Uh, I've always thought that, you know, you see the book on the shelf at a store and um, always thought they looked super interesting and the artwork was uh, always the correct amount of mysterious to kind of let your imagination run wild. Um, I always, uh, loved the idea of role-playing games, but especially at the time when I was a kid, the role-playing, uh, the barrier to entry was, was pretty high. I mean, you either knew somebody who was into role-playing and they could, you know, add you to their party and you could learn the ropes or, um, you're pretty much on your own. Uh, so I never really had an opportunity to play role-playing games, uh, until, I don't know. 10 years ago or so when I, uh, you know, the, the role playing community has, has just exploded with, uh, different, you know, non dungeons and dragons role playing games. Mm -hmm. And so I figured, well, maybe this is a good time for me to try to, uh, just GM myself and, and figure out what's involved because I'm never going to find, uh, the perfect group to uh, introduce me. I'll just figure it out myself. And, um, and that's when I started getting into uh, into games like Numenera and, and Fate, and um, as a game master. And so most of my experience in role playing has been as a game master because I was the only one of my friends that you know was gonna <laughs> put the the time and effort into into ingesting all of this material and, and figuring out the story. And it's only recently, really, that I've had an opportunity to to enjoy role playing as a player so it's kind of been this like long arc and now i'm finally at the point where uh where i was hoping to be when i was eight years old uh where i, I game master but also play and uh really enjoy uh tabletop role playing mm -hmm. now that br that brings me to uh oh, the to ageless chronicles um so first off something that i noticed is that you describe the setting that you have set up with ageless chronicles as a as a science fantasy um, rpg yep and when i looked at the art that you've got set up and a lot of the descriptors that you had written out um you made it very clear that one of your big one of your big inspirations was i know i know you use the term jrpg but i prefer um i prefer console style in my temple um <laughs> Was that was that was that something that was that was always a um was always one was always close to home for you when it where that where was that style of RPG? Yeah. So um, for some reason, I I always had uh, the generation or two older uh, game console of whatever was was mainstream. I remember all my friends growing up had the uh, N sixty four and then the GameCube and. Um, I had the original Nintendo and then and the Sega Mega Drive, which uh, in America I think it's the Sega Saturn. No, I Gen I Genesis. Genesis, that's it. Um, in England, it's called Mega Drive. I, I grew up in England, ah. and um, and so I grew up with that, and it was it was already a you know dated console by the time I got my hands on it. But mm -hmm. I just loved everything about it, and um, I loved how uh, the there was this kind of like niche market where you'd find games at the store like fantasy star um and fantasy star 4 specifically was 
a big influence uh, for me growing up in gaming um, that kind of like, it seemed like this really important part of my life mm -hmm. and no one else had ever heard of it. So you go to school and try to talk about Fantasy Star and, and, and no one cares. Everyone's talking about like Super Mario 64 or whatever. Um, and so it was kind of this like, it almost felt like a private uh, world where I could kind of enjoy that kind of role playing feel um, without having that mainstream pressure of, you know, it has to be a modern game or everyone else's opinions on it. I could just fully form my own opinion of these awesome games. Um, and I always loved the way that, that Fantasy Star blended science and fantasy without just basically making sci-fi. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a really fine line between the two where it, it's, it's way too easy to end up basically making a sci-fi game. Um, they always got the fantasy parts perfect. Like yeah. when you'd enter a town and it was kind of like a low tech town, mm -hmm. a village, it felt like a, like a fantasy world. It felt like they were struggling with the day to day, you know, making a living. And then when you progress through the game, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't played a, a 40 year old game <laughs> yet, um, it's you, you eventually end up, you know, on spaceships and, and battling, uh, huge ai machine and so the you're going from like hard sci-fi all the way to you know tolkien fantasy and it just had that that progression between the two that was really satisfying for me yeah and within the within that the in, the interesting thing because you see because um, that sort of mixture of of sf and fantasy you'd see a lot in um, rpgs of that gen of that generation um whether whether it be whether it be fantasy star whether it be um whether it be fun whether it be final fantasy whether it be um wild arms which is one which is one of those hidden gems i'm al i'm always fond of there is there is always there's always this ba there's always this balance between the two because more often than not and you've you've probably seen this when it comes to other attempts at science fantasy the approach of doing science fantasy ultimately ends up being a redressing of, oh, for lack of a better term, Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Not that, I, and not that I have anything against, Star, not that I have anything against Star Wars or anything, but that's so, but that's only one approach with this kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So sci-fi that has a slight mystical touch to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. That's that's been overdone, and Star Wars already does it great so i mean that's uh whereas things like fantasy star like i said growing up i felt like i was the only one in the world who knew what that game was and as an adult i realized oh no there's <laughs> there are dozens of us <laughs> there's lots of people that played that growing up and loved it and and loved jrpgs and anime and all that mm -hmm. but um there's not a lot um available right now uh it seems like it's it's always stuck in this kind of retro you know, this game's a retro game or in a retro style. Um, I haven't seen too many fresh takes on on that kind of setting. Uh, and that's one of the things that uh, really interested us uh, or, or captivated our interest for what kind of setting we should do for our RPG. And we all agreed this was a, a big part of our, our childhoods and uh, something a world that we wanted to continue exploring. And those games were, you know, just collecting dust um and you play them a hundred times but you know it's the same game over and over again mm -hmm. we want to go back to those worlds and explore them forever and that's kind of the the premise of our of our game yeah. the closest i can think of to a to a fresh t to a fresh take in that in the regard of how you're speaking is stuff like tenra which um is not well suited for long-term campaigns um now now, um, one of the one of the big things that you that is the claim to fame for Ageless Chronicles is its is its map system. Um, now, the first question I have to ask is when you when you finally got into um, got into really deep diving in 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 um, tabletop RPGs, um, did you do a fair amount of hex crawls and use that as the basis? So. Yeah, so w whenever we'd um, 
whenever in our sessions we'd use maps, um, it would it would typically uh, I don't know the right way to put it because I I love the um, I love the idea of of hex crawls and I love the idea of of having maps and having uh, miniatures and making it come to life like that. I always got frustrated, as you'll see from the from our from our game and the the endlessness of it. Is that, is that a word? Endlessness. That's the word uh, of it. Is that I always got frustrated that you know you can see the end of the map. Like it doesn't matter how big how big you make this map or how you could set up this whole you know your whole table with with models and miniatures and and have bringing as much as you could think of but it will always have an end you know once at some point you're going to hit the end of the table physically <laughs> and you you can't go any farther without having to set everything up again and i always love the idea of it so when you're zoomed in on one spot and you're saying oh here's a tavern um i think it's awesome and it would it would definitely help us all to imagine where we are and i noticed myself and everyone else uh, role playing and much better uh, when we can imagine where we're at um but it's just you're you're stuck in this one spot when you think about an overland hex map those really those work well in terms of planning where you're going but if you were to you know roll one of those out on the table physically um now you're you're so zoomed out that your your kind of imagination isn't isn't captured the same way so there's there's something with the digital side of of a hex crawl that I think really lends itself well to having that feeling of like that grid based exploration that mm -hmm. in person on, you know, around a table, the concept sounds so neat. And every time I see a Kickstarter where they're releasing maps and things like that, I'm always interested in it. And I'm like, but I'm never gonna, we're never gonna play it because I'm always gonna think once I use this one tavern, I'm never gonna be able to use it again. Everyone will recognize it. <laughs> and so, yeah, online uh, games. I've I've enjoyed that, but in terms of around the table, I've always found it kind of limiting in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Now, with the with the map system that you have for Ageless, you're you, you're using a um, using an AI ba AI based approach, where where it's go where it's going to be taking the hexes into account and cre and creating points of interest. Um now the fir the first thing that the first thing that I'm curious about is when it com is when it comes to the AI map creation itself is it one of those where it go where it goes fully random with the hex with the hex creation at first or is there or is it semi controlled So it's um it's controlled by the uh AI map engine is able it's able to um Kind of do what what we naturally do when you take a table and you roll on it for what should this area be. If you roll and it says uh, this hex is a is a city, and then you roll the next hex and it's another city, well, you know, well that doesn't make any sense. I would really have to explain why there's cities right next to each other because that doesn't typically happen. Um, and so you'd roll again, right? You'd say that doesn't make any sense. And that's kind of uh, what the AI is doing, although instead of rolling for each hex randomly and then trying to find you know don't put two cities together or like rules like that instead um without getting too far into the uh into like the the um secret <laughs> the secret ingredients of the of the whole thing mm -hmm. um it's it has the experience of seeing how uh maps particularly fantasy uh role-playing maps are put together and it, it it recognizes certain patterns. Um, mm -hmm. And from that, it's going to produce things that are that are in line with what you'd expect to find in a in a book off the shelf. If you pulled um, if you pulled a, a campaign setting off the shelf and opened it, you, you immediately know this looks like a real place I could go to and explore because someone painstakingly made all of those decisions. And so we're trying to uh, have an AI that that is trained to that point to where you basically have a a cartographer that is constantly going to know here's here's where this map should go if you should continue for the next you know billion miles. Mm -hmm. Now, I've I've um I've seen my, I've seen my fair share of of procedurally generated maps have having especially given the fact that um 
the that my whipping boy when it com when it comes to get when it comes to video games has been the Elder Scrolls for years. <laughs> yeah. And there while while I while I've certainly enjoyed my fair share of, proce of procedurally generated maps, there are moments where the um where the parts on the parts on that on that map end up with um interesting results like say like say dungeons and sit and cities literally one hex away from each other or sit or cities leading into more cities leading into forest leading into more city um have there have there been instances where where your where um your ai system has had that kind of setup or is it or is it built to kind of avoid that yeah so that's something that that it, when we see things like that, um, we're really looking to train that out of the out of the uh, AI model. So you're that's that's an error. Like that's uh, not the kind of maps we want Ageless Chronicles to produce. So mm -hmm. um, after you know feeding it data, um, we'll test it and make sure that it's making logical decisions that are that are fun and interesting. And uh, if it's surprising, it's surprising for a, you know in a lower way that that this place is interesting, not surprising in a, well, now there's this weird plot hole, you know, how can there be a coastline here if, you know, whatever. So yeah. we, um, we're looking for those things and, and, uh, we're going to be, uh, probably adding a, a process where, you know, if, if something completely ridiculous were to happen on your map, you'd be able to let us know and we could fix it. Um, cause it's kind of a constant constant training that you're doing and this and this system is only going to get better and better at uh making maps that that players love as we train it over time yeah now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to environments in in fantasy settings um i have frequent i've frequently talked i've frequently talked about um a thing a thing called the tolkien melting pot you know where where um a lot of a lot of what's considered generic fantasy is re is really drawing from this third generation idea of Tolkien of a very British style of um, f style of fantasy, which is not is not a bad I not a bad idea per se, but it's uh, it's cer it certainly has problems when it becomes the assumed norm. And when you look at a lot of the um, a lot of the inspirations that you go with, you, they're there tends to be a lot more varied environments in some cases. In fact, I distinctly remember the opening with um fa with Fantasy Star Four being in a being in a desert. So, I'm curious if um dif if different types of biomes are something that's being taken into consideration for the map generation system. Yeah, that's a really good point, and um and that is something that that set Fantasy Star apart from. Final Fantasy, where they Final Fantasy would stick more with with the the so called norms, mm -hmm. and uh, Fantasy Star would be kind of out there. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely something that that we we want to do. So we, like I said, we're we're training this AI on you know what does a what does like you said quote unquote a normal campaign map look like. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a lot of places that those campaign maps don't go. Um, typically. Uh, you know, with D and D and with Numenera as well, their their campaign map is pretty much a coastline, um, and then it will head inland for a period of time. At some point, there will be a mountain range, and then it just kind of stops, and you you guess at what's you know beyond those those borders, um, or you know you have additional books that might might say what those things are. Um, so for some reason, um, fantasy maps seem uh, anchored to uh no pun intended to uh coastlines and that's that's become kind of a like a norm um and then yeah it follows all the all the token style lots of forest lots of greenery mm -hmm. um mountains with you know snow snow capped mountains things like that which are which are cool i don't want to lose those um but now when you're saying let's extend this map and let's keep going um you're gonna have to start exploring those other places so what you know why wouldn't there be deserts and why wouldn't there be uh, all sorts of things with a yeah. science fantasy setting. Really, the the sky's the limit with what it could be. Mm -hmm. um, the only the only caveat to that is that uh, if you were generating a fixed space map or even like a globe, at some point you'd hit 
the poles, right? And you'd know as you get closer to this pole, the temperature would drop. And eventually this would be like a snowy region. So one, one uh, kind of <laughs> weird uh, uh, byproduct of, of this idea we've been playing with is that since there is no limit to it, you actually never hit, you never hit, the, there is no North Pole, right? Mm -hmm. So you, um, the snowy parts are really the part that I'm, I'm trying to figure out the best mix of um, how to have a good amount of, of snow and then difficult climates like that without dictating that, oh, we must be at the North Pole right now because, you know, these are like glaciers and things like that. So uh, aside from not having a top or a bottom to an, <laughs> to an infinite planet, um, I think the sky's the limit for where you could venture. It shouldn't just be one long coastline or, you know, a bunch of forests. Yeah. Now, in the in the example give in the example given of the um, of the generated city, um, Durnduri, um, one of the, I'll I'll start with the easy question. When landmarks are when landmarks are generated on a hex, are the names of the places generated as well? Yes. All right. Because, and that that brings me to my next question. When it comes to those generated names, are most of them going to be relatively easy to pronounce? Because there's been um there's been times with name gen with name generations that result in very interesting <laughs> results. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um. It's it's interesting. So um I I feel very comfortable with where we're going with this AI map system with with the hexes to me the idea of you know having it produce logical looking fantasy maps is something that that um i feel really comfortable with and weirdly you'd think okay now this place is a city let's give it a name you'd think that would be the easiest part um but like you said it's really um it's really difficult to make a realistic sounding name uh that would you know without it obviously having a human think about it. So uh, I've found that a lot of name generators, uh, basically, they have um, a bunch of consonants, um, some endings, and then and then I think some of them will have uh, variations to the beginning. And then it'll just like loop through and, and it'll be random, just like I was saying with when you roll on a random table. Um, you know, everything we do in RPGs when we want things to be infinite has to be random. Um, but names aren't random. And if you say, well, this is going to have, you know, 20 syllables and, you know, you're, you're ending up where, yeah, it's random. It's completely unique, but this, <laughs> this name makes no sense. And you almost have to explain why the name is so ridiculous. It's actually detracting from the story. So, um, that's going to actually be interesting because we're going to need an infinite number of names. Um, I don't want to have two Durnduris. I don't want it to even be possible for your campaign and mine to uh, generate the same name. So once it's generated, it's going to be stored and actually will never be generated again. So we actually, as a byproduct of this map system, might end up making a whole new way of generating realistic uh, names because we're going to need you know, billions and billions, and they're all going to have to be playable and sound good. So that'll be an interesting challenge as we get to the you know, as, as more and more common sounding names get ruled out, <laughs> how we're going to solve that problem. But, you know, the software engineer in me is, is excited by that challenge. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a software engineer, but I could see it be, I could see it being based on, being based on a series of, um, of syllables that are syllable like, um, like, by, like, for lack of a better term, sound bites that could be, that could be arranged in any order. Right. But yeah, and th and that's kind of how how they work on a simple level, mm -hmm. but yeah, like you said, you're you could take that and and make it much more complex and make it more realistic sounding, but that's something we'll have to experiment with um with a s relatively small sample set. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem we're going to hit right away. Um but it will be a it'll be fun to solve that because I'm I'm not satisfied with just a bunch of letters, you know. Yeah. Now roll together and then you pretend like it's a name you know yeah, it's no. got to be when it comes when it comes to the interactive elements um i'm guessing th those will be fo those will be f those will be integrated like in the in the example given um five taverns three inns and a marketplace is that is 
are you are you going to have material to um su to support those those um those elements? Yeah, so it's um it's gotten a little bit more complicated uh, now that we've opened it up to for this map system for backers only that they'll be able to use this map system for uh for other settings. Um so I've I've tried to not um specify too much about how those interactive elements will work and because I will some people might want to use it for D&D &D and they'll be like, "Well, your interactive elements don't work." And it's like, "Well, <laughs> it's interactive when you're playing it in Ageless Chronicles." Mm -hmm. Um, because obviously we're we're in control of the whole system and the character sheets are all online, so um, so that's why it's a little bit vague there because I'm it is going to mostly be like labels when you're using it for your own system, or maybe it'll be something from a, a table you fill and it will randomly generate it, um, but it won't really be as interactive uh, or anywhere near as interactive as when you're playing it or using it on Ageless Chronicles. So in Ageless Chronicles, you'll see, um, for example, the marketplace. When you, uh, when you as the GM show that, that we're at this location, it's going to show you all the different shops that are available. And certain shops will have different items and they'll have a different rate um, based off of the, you know, the standard rate. It might be more expensive or cheaper or whatever. Um, and you'll have the, each uh, shop will have an NPC with a name and with stats if, in case the GM needed to role play as them. Um, but then they'll be able to say show um show this store to the players when they do that on the players character sheets it'll come out and say you're at this store here's everything that's available um and they can actually just pick straight off of that what they want to purchase and have that you know the, the gold pieces and stuff come straight out of their inventory um for the taverns and inns it's more about the the npcs that are that are generated for you so as soon as you open it this is what i mean about name generation you go to one tavern and it might have five npcs and depending on their race they're going to have different names different stats um and so they're interactive in the sense that you have npcs just on demand that are at this place mm -hmm. um but the marketplace is really where that interactivity comes in where um instead of having unless you want to role play a whole market scene um if you wanted to quickly just let them shop um uh, that's something that they can kind of handle themselves where instead of it it's slowing the whole session down while well, someone looks at all the prices or asks questions, they can just see it all on their character sheet. Yep. Now, I did want to ask something regard shifting to the set shifting to the setting for a bit. Um, specifically, when it comes to your, the world that you have of of being filled with futuristic tech, um, a lot of times, whenever whenever future tech is introduced into a into a fantasy setting, it tends to go it tends to go along the ancient principle you know this you know this is lost technology that nobody that people don't that people don't understand or um or something along those lines and obviously one could make an one could make an allusion to numenera taking that particular concept and running farther with it than most other than most dare to tread but when it comes to the futuristic technologies of um ageless is it in that is it in that kind of setup or it or is it a bit better understood so to begin with um it definitely is on the side of of uh, being somewhat mysterious mm -hmm. um not necessarily ancient um but something that as heroes you'll encounter more than than the average person in a village who isn't going to go to these little known places and explore ruins and things like that um one thing without you know without making any promises that that we're we're thinking about down the road is um as as uh groups start playing this game more and you have these fleshed out maps and you um you have seeing the different variations of what's being created uh we're definitely thinking that that sci-fi part of it could end up being uh kind of an expansion to the game where you could potentially have um different alien races or different um different uh sci-fi options that show that those things overlap with the current timeline um it's somewhat ancient but that doesn't mean that there uh, aren't futuristic elements that are you know still alive um with their own goals and their own hopes and their own lore 
um, when we as we start out, it's definitely more on the fantasy side where uh, anything that would otherwise be magical is essentially uh, a science based. Um, but you have these augmented characters, so that's definitely something unique. Um, where you have, you know, like my character Ton Thornbuckle has a massive bionic arm, and that's how he has has these powers. Um, but down the road, I could definitely see us expanding the character options in a way that shows that uh, it's still this this science setting that uh, has non fantasy races that are that are alive with their own, you know, mm-hmm. with their own goals. Yep. Now. When it comes to when it comes to techniques, do do techniques fa- do techniques um also fall into also fall into the purview of magic just as a magic as technology approach? Um, so I need to get get a technique technique list up real quick. Um, let's see, but yeah, I think that I think that um a lot of the techniques. Uh, will be familiar to people who have played um, D and D and other games, except that obviously they're they're science based and not magical. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also uh, a lot of the techniques, especially when you get to the higher ranks, are much more powerful than what um, what they where they go in other games, um, in the sense that it's kind of intentionally unbalanced. Um, our game is not set up to be a combat simulator uh, where you're you know everyone you know one person has this amazing power and that means the the game's broken and everyone's jealous and whatever it doesn't work like that um so the combat system is much more everyone working together and everyone combining to create this this one large attack and so that gave us the ability to have techniques that really push those boundaries so there's a rank four technique for example that can that can like completely change the weather in an area um, and uh, another one that can can blind everyone in, in a certain area. And there's certain like game breaking level, you know, uh, techniques that you can hit because it is science based. So at a certain point, you're um, you're going to be really confusing people with how you're able to do these things. And uh, I forgot to mention before the our our uh, in terms of of ancient tech. Um, so we're already exploring. Um, we're not exploring. We're already showing that that it's not all ancient, in that the the weapons and armor list uh, in in typical fantasy star uh, uh, style goes from uh, your iron and steel weapons, traditional fantasy weapons, all the way up to eventually having a plasma sword and having a plasma rifle and having completely sci-fi gear. Um, those are something that gets unlocked as your characters reach higher levels. Um, so by the by level 20, your character is actually going to be more of a sci-fi character. Um, they're going to be wearing carbon armor and have, you know, all these different different uh, sci-fi gear. That it's almost like you start as a fantasy character and you end almost as a sci-fi character. And that's that's something I always loved about Fantasy Star. Mm. So we definitely kept that that in the game as a huge influence. All right, now. One th- one thing that I noted one thing that I noticed that I definitely find interesting is while you have a t- you have a total of ten attributes, um, but I did but um, I did but when it came to when it came to the skill aspect, I didn't see I didn't see as many, and actually actually when it came actually when it came to it, the skill list was wasn't given. But given the amount of attributes, would it be fair of me to say that? Um, attributes play a bigger role than skills do. Um, actually, uh, if if it would be interesting, I I can put the skill list on here. I assume that people wouldn't want to want to get into the minutia of it, but I mean, I why not? I may as well put it on there. Um, yeah. So your um your I don't know if it's true to say that attributes are more than skills. It's more that your your attributes. So, so each skill has a has a base attribute um, that your modifier for that skill is going to be based on. Um, so, if you have um, several charisma based skills and you uh, level up your charisma, that's going to l- basically level up each one of those skills. So they're they're kind of like interconnected. 
Um, anytime you roll, you're always rolling on a skill, even if you don't have that skill yet. So skills are really the main, main part of the game, uh, but it all eventually comes down to, you know, where you're at with each one of these attributes, especially willpower, because willpower is, uh, how much willpower you have is how much moxie you have to spend in social encounters and, and combat encounters. So, yeah. Now within, now within that's. The other thing that I that I noticed within this is the three um, classes that you have, um, hunter, rogue, and bionic. And I will admit, because of old habits, um, the hunter being the being the physical class threw me off for like a second. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but that, but I blame that I blame that more on being too genre savvy for my own good. But within those three classes, is it kind of going on the on the uh, tr on the warrior, rogue, mage trinity, just with bionics as the um, mage mage equivalent in this case? Yeah. So the the classes are are um, intentionally kind of generic um, because you're and and in that in that traditional sense with those three classes. Um, because around, I don't remember off the top of my head if it's level three or level four, but really early on in your character development, you end up taking what's called a specialization. And those are much, actually much closer to what classes are in D and D where at that point you can choose to be a bard or you can choose to, or at least progress towards that. Um, so your character kind of starts out, uh, as a simple hero that kind of, you know, you, you, you're either the mercenary or the. Uh, someone who's who's had like a troubled past, or you're you know if you're someone with a bionic arm or bionic eyes or something, you're you know <laughs> you're obviously going to fall into that group. Um, but as you start adventuring, um, you you level up the first few levels really quickly, and, and that obviously tapers off as the levels go up. And before you know it, uh, once you've done some adventuring, now you're deciding you know do I want to be a pirate? Do I want to um, you know the the real character development part happens in the first few levels. And so that meant keeping the classes as simple as possible because I feel like when I've made characters, I don't really know. Uh, I know what I want their voice to sound like and how they look and might have an idea of their fighting style or whatever, but I don't really know what I want them to be until I've played them for a while. A lot of times I'll get to level two or three and, and I'll be kind of kicking myself up with the decisions I made early on. And so this game kind of, you make those decisions gradually. And by, you know, once your character's, you know, the middle level, you really feel like you've matured because uh, they're completely different than they were at level one they're not just buffed up versions of all those day one choices yeah speaking of, speaking of that I, in my experience class design tends to fall into one of two categories one is the archetype approach where it's more where it's more about showing what you're be, what you're better at and giving you a starting package and then let and then letting you go relatively um free form the other option is the more ch is the more traditional route where where that class has a is a series of um benefits along a pa along a path um with something like the cipher system in Numenera falling right into the middle of that of that particular paradigm with given that spectrum where do where does the class design for ageless chronicles fall into so um with Ageless Chronicles, it's each whatever class you pick uh, definitely has an influence on on the options that you're given later on. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly doesn't doesn't become free form in the sense that that uh, a hunter could choose all the same things a bionic could. There's some things that that overlap, um, but yeah, there there's a little bit of a tree built in there of. Um, uh, where you're going to be progressing down a certain road and given those options. But at the same time, a lot of the options are also based off of um, uh, skill choices and attribute choices that you've made along the way. So um, some of that tree is going to be based on the decisions you make as you level up. So if you are a bionic, but you keep, you know, you or maybe choose a better example, you're a hunter and you're you're thinking all about physical abilities. Um, but over time, you start leveling up your charisma because you, you're finding that useful. You're finding that you enjoy role playing with those kind of skills. Well, suddenly there's new talents and specializations open to you now that you've 
hit this minimum threshold of charisma and also have some of those charisma skills. And by the end of the game, uh, you're a bard and you, <laughs> you didn't, you, you never thought you would be, but you, those options became available as you leveled up. So, um, it's, it's a tree that, that morphs, uh, as you make decisions when you level up. So I don't know where that puts that because I don't know if I'd say ciphers in the middle because to me, Cypher always felt like I made all the decisions right away. And I'm basically just, uh, all of my options are, are predetermined from my first starting sentence. And so I feel like we're, we're kind of more, in, more of a better, uh, more of a better, uh, <laughs> we're a better example of in the middle, um, where your, your options will change based on the decisions you make, which I think is much more interesting. Now, when you br when you brought up Bard, that al that also made me wonder if um if you have some if you have some sort of tree of adva of advanced classes a, a la Final Fantasy Tactics planned, or was or is that just or is that just being used as a shorthand? Um, I'm not really familiar with that. Actually, I didn't really play much Final Fantasy Tactics. Um, the instead instead of having a instead of having a set list of classes in ta you know tactics you had almost a almost a tree of classes that you that people could qualify into um starting out as starting out as squire and then ev and then evolving and then evolving further let me give me a moment let me see if i can get a um um because there's always there's always been advanced versions of classes when it comes to the when it comes to the um, job system, but that Final Fantasy has had for, since the since the beginning. Yeah, so I am um, based off of how you're describing it. That sounds that sounds kind of like what we're doing. Like for example, I just I just uh, looked up our list as well. So uh, if you wanted to have the specialization of uh, Beastmaster, which would mean that you've you have a animal companion with you that actually assists you. Um, that's open to any of the three classes, but you have a, a communication threshold you have to reach. Mm -hmm. And also you have to have uh, the animal handling skill. So if you were, if you were um, playing the game and you're thinking we're keeping encountering all these interesting animals, I would love to be able to start training them. And you took animal handling. Well, at level three or four, you're going to suddenly have, you know, the ability to be this person with an animal companion, whereas at the beginning of the game, you thought you were just going to be the one that heals everybody. But as you've enjoyed playing and, and your character has matured, um, the tree that's available to you is, is constantly changing. Uh, and by the end, you actually end up being, you know, the person that, you know, on the back of a flying creature or something like that. Mm -hmm. Also, I, f I found the tree I was looking for. I'll just send, I'll just send that your way. Oh, this is cool. Yeah. Now, obviously, obviously, I'm not. I'm not saying it's a one for one comparison. It's just that it. It's just that I was reminded of it with how you um, described it. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's not a one to one, but it's it's similar in that sense that that the the in my opinion the interesting character choices you make are are in the middle of the of the level tree not a, not at level one mm -hmm. um and uh yeah so you have at the beginning of the of the game you have your your classes and your your race and your background and things like that that will affect your initial starting stats um and kind of flesh out your backstory if you're not someone who has a great idea for a backstory it kind of gives you one um but then like i said when, when we've played uh, it, you start out and you're like, oh, I really like this character. He's fun. Let's see what, let's see where this goes. And once I chose my starting specialization, that's when I really started to get excited about what kind of character I was going to be. Um, and each time I level up, it, it feels like a different character. It doesn't feel like uh, Tom Thornbuckle is level six. He feels six times better than when I first made him. Um, he actually feels completely different. And if they met each other, uh, one one is uh, is very different, and mm -hmm. that makes it fun. So I'm not just leveling up to get get a stats boost. Um, I'm actually making 
important character decisions as we level up. Yeah. Now, when would it, would it be fair to say that one of the things that you wanted to avoid when it came to when it came to leveling up was um cho was choice paralysis or rather or, or rather um choice regret. Yes. Um I don't think I don't think anyone enjoys being punished for for uh decisions they made uh especially at, at level 1 when you didn't even really know. You might have done a session 0 but you don't really know what the campaign is going to be like until you get into it. And so you make all these uninformed decisions and hope for the best. Uh, and then later you find out the thing you chose wasn't actually electrical powers. It was something different. And now the whole game you're, you know, <laughs> you, you, you don't like your character and you have to just uh, live with that. So yeah. we wanted to avoid that and have lots of small decisions build up to shaping your character gradually. And of course there's a, I think we've all had that one DM who, um, who finds out that somebody wanted to do the whole master swordsman t um, archetype of character, so he makes encounters full of skeletons. <laughs> right. Or, or, or throw or throws rust monsters when somebody's when the when the party has a paladin with with a nice shiny suit of armor. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, those GMs exist. So <laughs> I think um, I think uh, th there's really two parts that that I uh, wanted to avoid with this design. And that's one of them is um, having the, the character decision regret. The decisions at the beginning are it's really just having fun mm -hmm. with seeing who your character is. Um, but the other part is that uh, not that there's anything wrong with min maxing. But uh, the the choice, the opposite one, the choice, you know, paralysis, where you're you're trying to make all the perfect decisions so that at, at you know level fifteen you'll be the, the strongest, coolest person ever. Um, we're because our combat system is so different, and our game is not weighted towards combat like other RPGs tend to be. Um, that doesn't tend to be a priority. So sometimes a player will join uh, a campaign. And they'll be thinking the whole time, oh, I don't, I don't want to accidentally, or I don't want to end up being the weakling that that you know spends three hours of every session running away from a battle because I'm so weak. So I'd better find out um, what the, um, I better you know Google it and and get a list of all the best decisions I can make so that I can be the, you know, the tough. I'm a healer, but I'm I can still fight or whatever. Um, our game doesn't have that problem um, because everyone has a part to play in combat. Uh, regardless of, of what their what their archetype is and what decisions they've made. So what we wanted to do was make it so that you're just kind of thinking one or two levels ahead and just enjoy playing. Enjoy playing and enjoy thinking uh, when you reach your XP threshold, you know, what, what kind of things do I wish my character had? And, oh, this skill would be useful because I kept rolling on that and failing. Instead of having all those options available to you, or not options, but having it all mapped out available to you at the beginning as if, you need to plan your level 20 decisions before you make your character because that's that's creativity that's that should be spent at the table mm. uh having fun with your friends and if if you have the option of over analyzing your character you know if you're like me you probably will and that's all that creativity just you know going out the window you may never even get to level 15 so just start playing and have fun so that, that's been our our goal from day one And when it when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the sheet in question, I did I did take a close look at the um, example image that was given, and one of the things I noticed was um, technique slots, which leads me to ask, right. um, because of the fact that it's that I saw a number of slots separated by rank. Um, are you guys going with a Vancian approach? Uh, what's the Vancian approach? Um, if you're familiar with the sp if the whole spell slots and and prepared spells and spells per day kind of thing that you see in um, D that you see in D and D and some early iterations of Final Fantasy, and when I say early, I mean essentially one and three. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's ki that's kind of where I'm going with it. Comes from Jack Vance. 
Uh, yeah, so it it uh, has some similarities uh, to to uh, how how it's done in, in D and D, where you're you know where there, like you said, you're preparing and, and just making those decisions on what your slots will be. Um, it's sort of like that, but it's um it's a uh, in our opinion a, a more streamlined, simpler approach. So you have uh, whether you are level one or level twenty bionic, mm-hmm. uh, you have ten slots available. Um, and your slots, if you have, uh, you have all of your techniques available every day, whichever ones you've, you've chosen as you've leveled up and each technique has a rank from one to four. And so when you want to perform that technique, you have to spend, uh, an available slot at that rank or higher. So you could do 10 rank one techniques, but if you have rank three techniques you want to do, you can only do two of those a day. So it's really a way of, of. Uh, making it so that there's not, um, you're not constantly counting how much MP you have and, and doing the math on that, which which isn't fun, and makes makes it like a math game, um, and also a complex way where you're at the beginning of the day again that that decision regret. What do I think I'm going to need today? And and you're not going to remember when you were right. You're only going to remember when you were wrong, and it's going to going to end up becoming a negative thing, um, or worse, you keep forgetting to do it, and at the last minute you ask the GM, "Is it okay if I?" That's not fun. That's that's a broken. That's a broken design because uh, if it was a good design, it would be fluid and and feel natural. So with this, you've chosen these techniques as you've leveled up. You, they're always there, and you're just deciding how to spend your available slots before you rest for the night. Um, if anything, it's closer to how stress boxes work in Fate Core, if you're familiar with that, um, than D and D. I I am. Oh. And I, I don't I don't particularly I don't particularly mind that um, Fate Core's setup, even if it even if some even if some Fate Core games I think could use a more defi- more defined skill list or have some skills not be um not be too t- not be too tied into derived attributes. But I'm get but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, it's not we- perfect. Now, when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, die roll setup that you had. Um, you're do, you're doing you're doing the standard d20 roll, and given the fact that you're doing d20 plus modifiers versus a target number, assumedly, would it be fair of me to say that the um the average target number as the baseline target number to overcome is 15? Um, let me get the table up real quick, just so I don't say anything misleading. Let's see. Because I was thinking it would be either fifteen yeah. or ten, like in um, Shadow of the Demon Lord. Yeah, so so a medium difficulty is is a fifteen. So I think those kind of gradually ramp up as your as your players level up. But yeah, I'd say the average on this is fifteen because that's a medium. Mm-hmm. Now, when now um. That does bring me to the co- to the um, combat system you you guys have set up. So, what prompted the idea of ha- of having it of having it effectively be party versus party instead of um char- instead of a character basis that you typically see? So, uh, like I kind of touched on before, um, so I'm I'm really big into user experience design mm-hmm. and. I, whenever you run into um, problems when you're playing a game or really doing anything, it's really easy to blame yourself or, or blame your group or, or the situation or whatever. Um, when most of the time, it's really, uh, in my opinion, poor design that, that causes things to uh, get held up. Because um, good design should be fluid. And so when we played RPGs um, as a group and... Um, Excuse me. We played uh, all sorts of different systems, all sorts of different settings, and we kept having the same problem. So we would end up in one of two uh, types of combat, and we didn't enjoy either of them. So we'd either end up in a in a combat system where you just say whatever you did, and and everyone says good job, and then you pat yourself on the back because <laughs> it's basically there isn't any combat, and you're just describing stuff and. Maybe there's a token roll or two, but it's not really combat. Um, 
it that's typically in your more narrative games when they get to combat it's kind of like well if you're into that sort of thing you can just narrate the combat um and we didn't find that very satisfying because it felt like our decisions were were arbitrary and then you have the other side which i guess is the more traditional combat systems where you have that nice crunch where your decisions feel important um and there's strategy to it the downside to that is that the whole game grinds down to a halt and we've played with with different players and we've played different settings and we've even simplified the rules on certain settings but we've consistently had the same issue every time we had combat which was someone uh, wouldn't be ready a different person each time wouldn't be ready uh, for their turn when it came up uh, so their turn would come up and they'd be like oh uh um let me uh and they're looking at their sheet and they're trying to decide and um and that's fine because it's it's not like you know it's not like a, a big test or anything but those those gaps those time spans add up throughout the game let alone once they make a decision and they decide to do it then they have to roll to hit and then they have to roll for damage and then you have to do the math on the damage and then the gm has to explain how the person re so there's you have zoomed in on this one moment uh as if it were really interesting which most of the time it kind of isn't i mean i'm going to uh hit him with my sword is not interesting enough to spend 15 minutes on it right nope. and <laughs> so we just kept getting stuck on like i don't want to not have combat and not have it feel crunchy and not feel like my character's cool um but why does it feel so slow and why does it is it just this huge this huge time waster in the game um also another side effect to that is uh, since you spent a lot of time uh, in combat, that's where a lot of the creativity comes in. So then it's like, well, I'll, I'm going to describe how I chop off their head. And then it just becomes like a, you know, the whole game is just about violence, which is might be your preference as a group. Mm -hmm. um, but what, but you know, we didn't like that. And the game was kind of forcing us to be like that because that was the only thing we were doing 24 seven because it took so long. And so we just, we were seeing these problems and you can blame so many things for it. Um, but then you stop and you think, well, maybe it's the game. Maybe this game just isn't isn't designed well. And there's lots of parts we like about this game, but the combat system uh, has just kind of been grandfathered in from how combat systems have always been since D and D first edition, which was based on a on a miniatures war game. Mm -hmm. um, so of course it feels like that, right? Um, so we started messing around with different ideas and. Uh, I was really inspired by uh, Star Wars Armada as a game I really enjoy, and also um, the Star Wars uh, tabletop RPG, where they you build up dice pools. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, but the feeling that your decisions build up a dice pool and then you just kind of roll them all and do the math makes for a really fast-paced experience. So we thought we'd take that all the way up and have the whole party basically makes one big pool. Um, and the more we messed with that, the more we realized... Uh, we were onto something and it was really fun and uh kind of has that part we were saying where if you're the tough guy you've you you're rolling a d20 or something and you might be the the weak person and you roll a d4 but you're still adding to that attack so it's not that you're so weak you miss all the time and you're useless you're adding to this dice pool um so everyone has that part to play but then as soon as you do your combat rolls you then have the moxie phase so then you have okay, here's where the creativity comes in. Here's where we zoom in. Does anyone in the party have a cool idea of some something they can do non-combat non related um, that's going to swing things in your favor one way or the other? And in my opinion, those are the parts that, that should take up the time in a session. Someone has a cool idea. The GM gives them a difficulty. Everyone's excited. They roll, you know, uh, and if they're successful, everyone cheers. If they're unsuccessful, it's funny and uh, we really wanted combat to to have that part be the be the focus, and the combat is really just like the the choreographed dance going on in the background. That you know you're you're kind of chipping away at each other, while in the foreground something interesting is happening. Mm -hmm. I need to have a short version of that of that <laughs> story, but you get yeah. the idea. Um, and since you brought it up, I want to ask about that. What it when I when I hear something like Moxie, um. I immediately think of a extra effort kind of kind of system. The same way, um, you have um, you have the for you have the force you have the uh, light and dark side points in um, in the FFG Star Wars RPG. I mm -hmm. have to I have to use that qualifier because I've got like four or five different Star Wars RPGs officially and a bunch more unofficially. <laughs> so, 
Eorum. Edge in Shadowrun Orum. F in effort. to a degree effort in Num Numenera. Is yeah. that how Moxie is is going to is working, or is it a different setup? Uh, it's a different setup. So Moxie represents your um, how much you're going to uh, in a social encounter speak up and and really try to make a difference in the situation. Uh, in a combat encounter, Moxie is really that nerve that you have to step away from combat and and do something interesting. Um, so it's actually like a like a um, a pool you're spending from in order to take the the um, the focus of the game for a moment. And so sometimes you'll have players that with the best intentions, um, like you can tell from this from this from this interview that I talk a lot, right? <laughs> so I might have the best intentions as a character, but unintentionally, I'm taking over the whole session, right? Whereas the way the moxie works is I can't do that every round or I'm going to run out of moxie really quick and I'll be sitting there listening for an hour. And so it really makes you decide, do I really have a good idea right now? Um, should I spend moxie or should I just pass? So it kind of just gives you that currency to spend and to think about, is it worth spending or should I let someone else be creative? Which I can see. So in that regard, would it be, f would it be more fair to say that it's a edit button? Yeah, works more like that. Some 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 limited some narrative limited resource approaches work work in that manner. Um and the way the the way you describe social encounters as people as players spending moxie, is it a case where it where it'd be like a bidding war between between participants? Um no, it's really just a um it's really a signifier um to show that you you're not skipping your turn so you're going around in turn order saying you know so and so do you want to spend moxie or do you want to pass it's just like a um you actually have to spend it so instead of having that like oh yeah i'm going to do something uh um uh, that kind of thing you're, you're spending something so you're going to decide do i really want to spend it do i really have a good idea uh if not i'll pass and if i have a good idea before my next turn then i'll spend it on that one so it's really just a way to like give a cost to taking the attention at the table so that when the attention is taken, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other, the other thing that I'm, the other thing that I'm curious about is I know, I know that you're doing um, natural ones are an, are an automatic fail and natural twenties are an automatic success. But when it, when it comes to criticals, Especially in especially in combat, um, there's there's a couple there's a couple approaches that I that I see happen most frequent. One of them is the is the double damage, at, with or without a um, confirmation. Some some do it with, some do it without, or just doing maximum damage. Um, what's the approach that you have if some if a natural twenty was rolled during um, combat? So in combat, uh, each player around the table is represented by a die between D4 and D20. Mm -hmm. So everyone is, is not rolling a D20 for combat. It depends on what, what your weapon is and, and different modifiers that go into it as to what your, uh, your die roll is. So that brings the point of you know what would a critical look like on a D4 versus a D20. You technically... You well, not even technically. You, you, you'd be much more likely to hit a critical on a D4 than a D20, which doesn't really make sense, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it already kind of doesn't really lend itself well to that. As well as that, one thing we wanted to avoid with combat was having... We want the roll to feel uh, important. Like, if, like I said, if you're the one rolling a D20, you're going to feel awesome when you do it. But we didn't want it to feel like that was your primary, um, your primary tool for resolving this encounter. And so I really have tried to avoid having, you know, when you trying to roll and like, oh, if I just rolled higher, oh, if I just rolled higher, oh, I hope this roll is good because that's not really the, the way you're trying to solve it. The role is to get that whole, okay, I'm bigger than you, so my role will probably be higher than yours. Let's just do it and see mm -hmm. uh, part over with. And then you have the moxie to do, do the interesting stuff. So if you do that, um, that reward, that slot machine thing where, Every so often, something amazing happens. 
it almost overemphasizes that attack role, which should really just be really fast and just kind of represents the general strength of each party um, without it being something that you're you're rewarding just rolling because just rolling, you know, is kind of boring. So we, we want to reward the role playing. And admittedly, in this kind in this kind of thing, I could like if I if I was house rolling this, I could pro I could I'd probably have I'd probably have it that um roll that rolling a max is a threat is takes the fantasy craft approach where it's a threat. It doesn't do anything on it. It doesn't do anything on its own. But um spending a resource like say moxie might put might throw in some additional effects. Yeah, no, there could definitely be room room for that. I think our uh, our main thing we have, I don't think it's on the Kickstarter, but the main thing we have in the in the rules for the combat, uh, at the very top it says, um, the moxie phase is the primary way that players can creatively swing the odds in their favor. So we, we kind of, we wanted to balance uh, combat by kind of having it, uh, we wanted to have the three different things when we were testing it. We wanted to have uh, two equal-ish, parties, well-matched parties, should basically go back and forth forever, and it should almost feel like the battle's never going to end. We wanted it to be slow and boring because we wanted there to have to be some creative way to swing this in their favor. Otherwise, it's it's just a bunch of skilled people parrying each other for forever, right? Mm -hmm. um, the combat itself will not resolve itself. You need to think outside the box. Then you have the other two possibilities, which is you're, you're outmatched or outnumbered. Um, that should end quickly. You might only have a couple rounds in before you're subdued. Uh, and the other one is obviously the, the opposite of that. If you've outnumbered and outpowered someone, that should be a very fast combat encounter. Um, and so we really wanted to have like the, you know, outnumbering people and out, uh, and being stronger than the other person should really show. And if you're equal, um, it's not about who rolled better in the combat. It's about, okay, there's got to be a better way to resolve this because we're just going back and forth here. Like we wanted that. So anything that we add to the role that makes it where, oh, maybe if I rolled that again, we'll beat them. It almost makes, it makes the combat part the, the tool to solve it. Whereas we're trying to heavily incentivize the tool for solving it is the creativity. Um, and so that's going to be the, the main way that, that players really feel like they have that, that critical success. And certainly if they spend a moxie and do a skill check and they roll a natural 20, then that's, that's going to have an awesome effect on the, on the combat. So mm. that's really where those, those criticals happen. Yeah. Now with that, with that, with that said, um, now you're, you're, you're about halfway, you're about halfway there with, with 14, with 14 days and, and in lieu of what I'm about to say, let me knock on wood to make sure I don't jinx you. So, <laughs> so, we, so, presume now, presuming that it, presuming that um, that everything go, everything goes, everything goes as planned. Um, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not for the not for the full release, but just for the early phases of the project. So, um, yeah, so our, our main release is, is by the, by the end of the year. Um, but the, the, apart from the map system, the rest of the game is pretty much ready to go. Um, and so our goal would be in the next month or two to have that, that available, uh, so that, uh, people could start using it, start uh, breaking it <laughs> and start giving their good feedback. Um, while we continue working on the map system. So it should be a pretty quick turnaround because it's it's playable now. It's really just setting up the, you know, allowing people to sign up and set up their parties and things like that. All right, I can I can certainly get that, and I'll definitely be looking forward to seeing how it um, develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say, drinking is not mandatory here, but it is encouraged. No, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to...
come on in and enjoy, and enjoy the fun. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>